He's no longer being pressed in the, right, in the tight noose of dissatisfaction and worry over promotion, position, hypocrisy and forced friendship for business reasons. This business of friendship can also be embarrassing sometimes, even to a gentleman of leisure. I remember one day when a showy character who disliked the police on a matter of principle met a gentleman. You come with me to Katong Man and we'll have a good beer. Sorry about my bad Singapore accent. The showy fellow said, what's wrong with a beer in town? The gentleman said, oh, I've got a small trouble in Katong. You can help me settle it and I give you a beer. So the gentleman went to Katong to help the friend. He had a beer and half an hour later, the small matter that his friend had come to settle came up in the form of 11 gangsters armed with parangs and bottles and sticks, which goes to prove that even a gentleman has to be wary about his friends sometimes. And it was quite interesting um, while I was in Cambridge looking through these uh, documents, uh, manuscripts with um, Jacinta. There was a list, you know, in these notebooks, there, there were not only writings but lists that Nalpon had made. And one list was of assets, and in that list was mentioned one parang, which is kind of quite interesting in the context of that story, why he would have a prang. I'm sure it was quite innocent and so forth. But it does remind me, if you've ever seen the Singapore film Perth, I don't know if you've seen that, the Gay Lang Massacre, when the taxi driver opens the boot of the car and says, parang, because one never knows. <laughs> <laughs> have we got time just for one more? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think it's heartbreaking in many ways that me, some Angmo professor um, is reading these and Gregory Nalpon himself is not reading these. So I wanted to finish perhaps with something that's, that almost sounds to me as if it's, you know, Gregory Nalpon speaking directly to us. In the, in the magazine Her World, strange enough, I find it quite strange that Gregory Nalpon published so much in Her World. I don't you know, Cyril, you, you'd ever, ever think of publishing there or, or have. But you have, you have. Okay, so so interesting confession. Um, but yeah, so several stories were, were published in the mid seventies by Gregory Nalpon in her world, and he also wrote an essay towards um, the end of his life. And I just want to read um, a bit from that just to finish. And perhaps I'll just read the end because. Uh, in some ways, I'd like to, like to read the first bit, or I'd urge you to read the first bit, because it's very interesting, and because there's a, a very direct and very moving appeal to um, Gregory Nalpon's daughter, Jacinta. I mean, in many, in many ways, you know, I'm meant to be an academic and so forth, but th this story kind of moves me the more I fi find out about it. You know, Gregory Nalpon died at the age of 40 suddenly, and he left a family emotionally and financially bereft and in a way perhaps it's taken them a very long time to kind of recover from that that kind of situation and in this I think it's, it's very poignant that Jacinta was given by her father two kind of letters or kind of creative works that um, Gregory Nalpon wrote for his daughter at, at her birth and also on her 14th birthday and obviously she's treasured them and and they are quoted here perhaps I'll just read the bit that's written for Jacinta here okay well, Jacinta, little flower of my heart, it is necessary to remember that you must always be free to preserve all the rules or break them if you have to. Feel as exhilaratingly free as the pup I saw this morning, racing crazily over the seashore, lime-sweet spray and the early sun matted on his coat. Do not forget that life is a story told by God to each one of us. Only a story. A story that we personally see and feel. Sad and happy stories of pain and courage and sacrifice of bitterness and despair, joy and love. Stories we actually live through with God as the master, storyteller imparting a different take to every single one of us with birth as its beginning and what we call death as its end. And we are free to bear the story out or run away like bored and restless little children. Of course, those who run away discover it is impossible to find their way back to the lap of God and the story has been told. So Jacinta, use your freedom wisely there's also a nice little bit where he recalls how um, Jacinta laughed as a little girl. I think she was like um, 11 or 12, but her father was showing her how to ride a bike and he fell off. And uh, Jacinta laughed and her dad smacked, it, smacked her bottom. And he's saying, you know, I, I talk, in a way he's showing, he's a kind of strict pater familias, but he's also saying, you know, in a, in a way, perhaps I'm a, a pompous ass to some, some degree. And... Uh, uh, he, he's, he's also kind of poking fun at himself as, as well as other people. 
But I also wanted to, to talk about um, Gregory Nalpon's other child, Zero, who is now quite a prominent lawyer in Singapore. It's quite a distinctive name that he's called Zero. And here, um, uh, Gregory Nalpon explains why he's called uh, Zero. According to the, this um, essay, um, it almost caused a divorce that um, uh, Gregory Nalpon's wife, Mona, almost divorced him because he insisted or cunningly got his child kind of legally named Zero. And Zero does seem quite a, a weird name, but th this explains it perhaps. The affair of the near divorce was precipitated by my son, Zero. Yes, Zero. If we had another girl, she would by common consent have been called Francesca Bella. But I was quite clear in my mind that a boy would be nothing other than zero. Think of it, he can never be less than zero. His is a natural platform for achievement. Every mark scored in school, every act in his life cannot but be a logical advancement. And if his first initial appears on his test paper as well, he does not own the copyright to it, does he? <laughs> at, the at the baptismal font, however, the godparents begged to decline the signal honour and I that I bestowed upon upon them. The priest, upon learning of the infant's intended name, did a most unpriestly thing. He called me aside and in a very grave whisper threatened to assault me. <laughs> and so the son was christened Geraldo Mario, and there was a sound like leaves soughing in the, in the breeze. It was a concerted sigh from those assembled in church. There was much merriment and relief after the baptism, and the wine gurgled sweetly down many throats. But there were some in the house who looked disconcertedly at my happiness. It was generally postulated that I had overcome the folly of my thoughts, that I had forgotten the magic name Zero. Where's my water? Sorry. <laughs> One last time. But I had learnt how to play poker during quiet nights in Sarawak, and I'm sure he did, he spent a lot of time in, in Sarawak. And my teachers were masters of the art. I still held the trump card, and my, my son's birth had yet to be registered. So on the very last day permissible, I presented myself at the registry of births, and with deep pride and dignity announced my son's name, Zero <laughs> Geraldo Mar Mario Nalpon. I will never forget the fineness, the solemnity of that moment. I had named my son. Many friends who doubted my courage in naming my son threw a small feast in repayment of a wager. And uh, Gregory Nalpon, as well as being a great writer, I think was quite interested in a little gambling and, and, and a little card playing. The courage that they failed to recognise was to surface in that moment of truth when I delivered the mint new birth certificate into my wife's keeping. She was too busy consulting her lawyer to notice the exhibition of my courage. Neither did I, for that matter. Well, Zero is getting along fine in school. He's had his share of fights to stamp out ridicule, and in art class, he signs his name proudly, Zero. He's a good student and a good scout. He loves adventure as much as I do. The hikes and the camping, the fishing, and a bit of shooting, well-watered whiskey to keep out the chill at night, and an appreciation of feminine charms. He can safely aspire to be a smuggler or just a contented bum if he succeeds in traversing the age of puberty. So very good Singaporean ambitions for children. Uh, <laughs> I have given Jacinta her sermon and Zero his name. I am content in the knowledge that I have done my duty. I too must now rest. Okay, so thank you very much. I have a question. Oh yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Robin from the press. Uh, oh yes. National Critics Choice. Uh, the question is that, uh, what's the inspiration behind the title, The YM at Eight Milestone? Oh right, um, that, that, that's a, a kind of, uh, it, so, so why, why this volume is called this, yes. you, you're asking. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and give a short answer, which is very difficult for, for, for me over, over these kind of things. Well to me, I, I must confess, it, wor it wasn't my choice, it was something that the publisher came up with, and I, you know, behind the scenes perhaps there were a few tussles with the publishers, but on this point I thought it was a stroke of genius that they chose this name, because in a way I think it really, it's a double whammy, it really kind of evokes old Singapore, forgotten Singapore in two ways, I mean Wayang, you know, they used to be Malay Wayang, didn't they? In, in, it's a Malay word, and it's kind of been marginalised. Even Chinese Wayang seems to be less and less happening uh, in Singapore. But also, eight milestone. I'm sure some of us know what, what's meant by eight milestone. 
I see younger faces amongst us, not, not quite so sure, but there were these kind of milestones, weren't there, from the centre of Singapore, you have one milestone, and I think it's, it lives on in some of the names that we find in Singapore. So in, in a way, I thought that was great. But behind that lies the fact that we did do a little bit of um, edi editing. Oh, I'm going to reveal some secrets here, and if this is ever put on YouTube or whatever, perhaps this, this wasn't the, the wisest idea, maybe we can edit this out and I'll just secretly tell you this. But um, uh, one story in here that, that, that we, we put in, which is called the uh, courtship of uh, Donatello Varg Vargo, uh, I think that, that, that that's right, the title, was originally published in one of Robert Yeo's story collections as a girl as sweet as Alice. And I've yet to find out from Robert Yeo if he actually edited this story down from its original into a girl as sweet as Alice or something else had happened. But in some ways, we, d we, we are guilty in some ways of doing a little bit of editing as well. So the story of the Wang at Eight Milestone, we love the title, but it belonged to a very small and slight sketch that uh, Nalpon had written. But it, it grew into a story called An Eye for an Eye and so we decided to swap the title around and add bits of the sketch which seemed to be very nice into the story and, and so forth. But perhaps we felt kind of justified in, in some ways in, in doing that because it, you know, both of them fused together. I think Jason Lundberg kind of helped with this and assisted with his own kind of skills. It was almost like weaving a tapestry or, or putting these two kind of fragments together. And so do, do you have any regrets or do you have any conclusions on how this book will end? How, how it is at the moment? Yes. How, um, would, you, would you ever add in more stories? Or? Well, my hope is that we'll have a second volume. That, that, that we, I mean, in a way, this is a work in progress. This is where we are at the moment. But I'm hoping maybe, if there is interest and so forth, maybe we could do a slightly more scholarly work. I mean, one thing that I found really interesting in Cambridge was to find one of the... Um, Gregory Nalpon's notebooks, and it was like covered from page to page. You know, it's fascinating, and it, it worked this way: that um, on this side, it, you know, he was writing his notes all the way through, and then he went backwards. I, I hope I'm making myself clear. But then he started again at the back on this side, and wrote all the way through. So, I mean, in a way, it would be wonderful. To, I, I'm sure it's going to be impossible, but to do an, a facsimile of that notebook would be kind of wonderful. But to have some of this material in a yeah, a second volume would be nice if it's possible. Yeah. You know, having a state here in Singapore, what does Singapore mean to you today? I don't think you should ask. I'm not very good at answering that kind of um, pol politically, perhaps, or, or in, a, in a kind of a politic way. Well, well the sun's shining. I think that, that's very nice and so forth. Well, the least that's left. And, that's the hmm? point. Uh, well, I'm not a poet. Oh. Um, but uh, that, that's my loss in some way. I'm a mere scholar and so forth. But um, yeah. I'm always moaning about Singapore, but um, I, I don't think I'd like to be anywhere else. <laughs>